Hey, and Happy New Year. I'm Sarah, and today it's time for part two of my Android testing series. In this video, I'll go over how to create shared test modules, and also how to use JUnit 5 and Turbine to test view models, data store preferences, and flows. For the JUnit 5 unit test that I demoed in my previous video, I used static and dynamic KTOR mock clients, and also hard-coded and dynamic JSON strings in my tests. So here you can see I set up a KTOR success client, I pass the mock engine, and then I configure my plugins. Well, I wanted to use those same values in my Android test too. So to do this, I created a shared test module. In the next slides, I'll demo a shared test JUnit 5 Turbine project that I've added to my GitHub repositories. If you'd like to follow along, the link is in the video description. To get started, Create an empty activity or open up an existing project in Android Studio. Next, switch to the project view from the IDE dropdown. Right click the project root, then select New Module. On the Create New Module window, select Android Library. Next, enter your module name and other settings, then click Finish. Now, in your project, you'll see the new shared test module. Switch back to Android View. Here you can easily navigate to both your main app and the shared test module. All of your build.gradle files will be under Gradle scripts labeled with the corresponding project or module. If you check out your project settings.gradle file, you'll notice the includes for app and shared test. This is how you can reference your modules from other modules. I'll show you what I mean next. To add your main app as a dependency in your shared test module, first, go to your shared test Gradle file and add app as an implementation dependency. And then in your app Gradle file, add shared test for test implementation and Android test implementation. Next, while still in your app Gradle file, add the JUnit 5, coroutines, mock K, and the turbine dependencies. Here, I've added them for unit testing and Android testing. Before we can start running tests, we still have a few more things to set up. In your project Gradle file, add the JUnit 5 plugin. Then, apply the plugin in your app Gradle file. If you sync now, you might get an error at this point. And that's because we also need to connect JUnit 5 to the Android runner. So you can do that here. We'll also need to add Use JUnit Platform in our test options. Now that everything's set up, let's create some shared data. In my shared test module, I create a simple data class. I instantiate a shared data object that I can use in my tests. And I also create a flow of shared data objects so we can test Turbine. With the shared module data in place, go to your main app and create a new unit test in the test package. Make sure to import from Jupyter API when you add the import. Finally, create a test that uses the shared data object. From inside our main app, we can get an import to our shared test dot test shared data variable right here. We can do the same thing for our Android test too. Here, I've also added a test that uses Turbine to test our flow. Now you should be able to use the data from the shared test module in both your Android and unit tests. Before I get into the code changes and new Android tests for my City app, I just wanted to go over one more thing in my project setup. When I was writing my test, I got a mock K IO error due to a missing SO file that looks like this. So you might see something uh, regarding the JVMTI agent not found. I was able to fix it by adding use legacy packaging in my app's Gradle file. I've included an issue link for more information, and after that fix, I was good to go. Once I had the shared test module in place for my City app, I still wasn't ready to start coding my Android test yet. Next, I'll go over a few things that needed refactoring and some issues that I faced while writing my tests. In my viewmodelscope.launch calls to my KTOR API, I use dispatchers.io, but for my Android test, I need this test to run on the test dispatcher instead. 
So the first thing I needed to do was inject a dispatcher into my home view model. And then for help, I added a dispatchers provides function to easily provide the dispatchers.io. Then back in my view model, I just replaced the hard coded dispatcher with my injective one. So view model scope dot launch and then the injected dispatcher here. And I did the same for my user repository too. This one has a flow and it flows on the IO dispatcher or in this case, the injected dispatcher. And now back to my view model, when I started testing, I found some bugs. So here's the old code. When I combine my flows, the logic to load apps with API keys was actually running twice. It was running once when the current user flow updated and again when the apps updated. To fix it, now I just get the apps when the current user flow changes. Now it only makes the API call once when the view model loads and just like that, testing improved my user experience. For my Android test, I wanted to add coverage for my two key components that hold most of the app's business logic, my user repository and my home view model. The examples I'm about to show you are both technically still unit tests, but each of them use data store preferences, so they needed to be in the context of the Android test package. Now I'll head over to Android Studio and go over my Android tests. Here's the city app that I've been working on, including my shared test module. So back in my Android test, the first thing I needed to do was create a test data store. To do this, first I get the test context from application provider. We need this context to create the data store file, which is completely separate from our app data store. Next, I set the scope to the custom test scope that I've defined in my test. So if you take a look at the source, the preferences data store factory defaults to dispatchers IO. This might not crash your tests or cause an exception, but if you leave the data store running on dispatchers.io, the threads could switch back and forth from dispatchers.io to your test threads, which can lead to inconsistent test results. So here is a function that basically takes the scope that's defined in my test and sets it here and then creates a completely different data store called test underscore data store. In my user repository test, to pass the test scope to my test data store, I create a custom scheduler, a standard test dispatcher, and finally a test scope that uses both. Why did I use a standard test dispatcher here? The standard test dispatcher is a closer match to production scheduling than the unconfined test dispatcher. Unconfined test dispatchers is eager and more immediate, and it isn't great at emulating concurrency. So here I create the custom scheduler and the test dispatcher, and then the scope that consumes the dispatcher. And then here I create a mock case by for my user API service, then create my user repository, passing in the test data store and the mocked API service as dependencies. To make sure that all of my tests use the same scheduler, it's important that I pass my IO dispatcher to, to every run test instance. Otherwise, my tests will hang and they'll never complete. So here on my before each, I call run test, I pass the test dispatcher, and then I reset the data store every time, so I'm starting fresh, and I also clear any mocks that were defined in a specific test. For these tests, I just go through the core functionality of my user repository. So when I want to test if is onboarding complete equals false, I run my test, I pass in the test dispatcher, and then I manually set the last onboarding screen that was viewed to one. My user preferences flow maps my data store items to a user preferences data class. Here, I can easily use the terminal first operator to get the first flow emission. And then I can run my asserts here to make sure that everything matches up like it should. It took me a minute to really understand how dispatchers, schedulers, and scopes work together behind the scenes for each test. If you're unsure about the current scope that you're currently running in, you can easily print things out and verify your context. So here I just print out the current context and it will give you something like this. And you'll have a printout of your scheduler, 
And you can see here that it's using a standard test dispatcher and you get, can get the memory IDs of each that's running in the current scope. And then for this test, I just set the onboarding screen to two when I run my assertions. Testing for a signed in user is a bit more challenging. Here, I use my KTOR mock client to return the user. I've already gone over this in my previous video, so I won't go into too much detail here. Just a quick note, user response success is coming from my shared test module, so I can use these mocks in both my Android and unit tests. So this is the one that's coming from the shared test module. And then I create my mock for every call to client, use my mock. And then I can set in my data store, I can set my user ID to one. And then I can bring back my flow and make sure that I have a signed in user. I'm running these tests against a Pixel 6 device API 33. I'll go ahead and run this test now so we can see the results. And here we have our successful test and everything worked out great. But you all know me, I couldn't stop there. I was curious to check out other ways that I could run tests on my user repository too. So here, my initial setup is the same. But this time, I set dispatcher's main to my test dispatcher. With this, I don't need to pass IO dispatcher to every test. It's really convenient, but is it technically right? So in my before all, I set main to my test dispatcher, and then I clear it after all. This approach works because when you call set main, every standard test dispatcher that's created afterwards in my run tests will automatically use the scheduler from the main dispatcher. But if you check out the Google Docs, it doesn't really seem like this is the best approach for my Android test. Here's the link if you want to check it out. Setting main seems like it's really only for replacing the Android UI thread, and to quote the Google Docs note, you should not replace the main dispatcher in instrumented tests where the real UI thread is available. So after reading this, I was a little bit hesitant, and I decided to go for the first approach that I demonstrated a few seconds ago, which is manually setting the dispatcher for each test. But here, as you can see, by doing this, I can just call run test without passing anything, and it works great too. And finally, I had to try one more thing. So here I pass an unconfined test dispatcher to the data store. And using this approach, my tests don't hang. I don't have to pass the IO dispatcher that I've defined for every test. And I don't need to call set main. This is because unconfined test dispatcher is eager and it runs my coroutines with a more synchronous immediate approach like run blocking test would. So here I create the custom scheduler and then I use unconfined test dispatcher instead of standard. And then everything else is the same. I set everything up. And as you can see, I don't have to, well, actually I ran a little experiment. So in the before each above, I pass in my IO dispatcher and write it out to the console. Then in the test below, I just call run test with no parameters. This uses my unconfined test dispatcher in the before each and then creates a standard test dispatcher in my run test with a different scheduler ID and memory. So it ends up looking something like this. The first context is, so you can see my test coroutine scheduler, and you can see the ID here. In the actual run test, you can see that here we have a standard test dispatcher, and we have a completely different memory ID for the test coroutine scheduler. With a different scheduler running for the data store and the test, I don't feel like this is a test that I could actually trust, but it was really interesting to see the different schedulers and dispatchers in action. My home view model test was a bit more challenging. Here in this test, I used the same standard test dispatcher setup. So I set up my test coroutine scheduler, the dispatcher, and then the test scope that uses the test dispatcher. Then I create my view model dependencies, and before every test, I clear any mocks, clear the data store, set up my KTOR mock client responses, and I instantiate the view model every time so it starts fresh with a new state. So clear the mocks, clear the data store, set up my client, and again here I'm using my shared test module clients. And then I create my view model here. So in this test, I just get the initial value of my UI state 
this is easy enough. So I just call the value on it, and then I can make my assertions. But testing the UI state flow is much more challenging. This flow uses state in, which is a hot flow that never completes. For this, I use turbine to await my key emissions. So here I start my test and I pass my test dispatcher. I set my user repository to one, so I have a valid user ID. And then I actually start the turbine test and I wait for my initial state. And here I declare everything in a variable so I can easily access it and have a typed way to reference what I'm waiting for. And next I wait for the signed in user to populate, which is here. And at this point, I can actually run my first assertion and make sure that I actually get back a signed user. Then finally, I wait for the apps to load and make sure that the count is two. So here I wait for my apps and I make sure that it actually has two apps in the app summary list. And then finally, when you're done, make sure to cancel and consume remaining events. And I wanted a few different ways to represent the test and I was just trying out a few different options. So in this one, I make sure that I can add an app. And here I use a different approach for the various UI states. So here I'm not actually setting the variable, I'm just asserting um, the first state and I expect the most recent item and the current user. And then I run another assertion, I wait for the signed in user here. And then I actually call home view model add app, which adds a blank app in my view model. And then I wait. And then again, I can run another assertion and make sure that my selected app, app type is of type development. And again, I cancel and consume remaining events. So in this test, I tried something even more different. I wanted to use a for each loop. So for each of my states that I'm waiting for, I just await the item. And once I have all my items, I call home view model on app clicked. And then I verify, and then I wait for my selected app. And then I make sure that when it finally comes back, the API key matches. And then finally I cancel and consume remaining events. Turbine also has a test in option and I wanted to give that a shot too. So here I create a variable and I call the test in using my test scope. And then I, using this variable, you await each item. So I get my initial state. I wait for my signed in user. I run my assertion. Now I wait for the apps to load and make sure the count is two. And finally, you call the variable and then cancel and consume remaining events. Let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. So here are my tests. Everything worked out great. And as you can see on the more complex tests, it prints out all of my API calls, my mock API calls. And you can see it prints out the JSON for getting the user. And then I can see the JSON for actually getting the apps. So that's pretty cool. So that's pretty much it for my Android test. Thanks for watching.